for the last day of our 23rd annual conference of IASG and we all have assembled here for the most prestigious Veera Bhai J.R. Das Agarwal oration. And we have with us Dr. H. Ramesh who has contributed a lot for surgical gastroenterology in our country more so in the particular area of interest and all of you are aware that he opted to give the database on chronic pancreatitis to be used by all of us and he has worked with all the people who has promoted surgical gastroenterology in India and it's appropriate that he talks on a topic surgical gastroenterology looking back and with his vision looking forward may I now call dr h ramesh our past president to come on to the dais to make his presentation on veera bhai das agarwal oration dr ramesh Mr. President, in absentia, <laughs> Secretary of the ISG, uh, Sanjay Debakshi, my colleagues in the association and, and friends, I cannot help saying what a privilege it is to deliver the oration which is customarily delivered by the past, immediate past president of the association. I must commence with several apologies. First, that my uh, recent viral fever has left my voice rather depleted. Second, it's customary for the presidential oration to be uh, a nice window of opportunity for people to leave the hall and meet old friends and have a, share a cup of coffee. And I've conveniently seen to it that the coffee vendor is closed at the moment. And last but not least, I, I, I certainly will close well ahead of time. It's important for us to understand the, why this oration is in the name of Virabhai Jayardas Agarwal, who is uh, the mother of uh, a leading surgeon in Delhi who ran a clinic. I'm not sure if he himself is alive at, the, at this time, but Professor Aranya, who was the first secretary of the IASG, was so desperate because of uh, lack of funds for the IASG that he uh, had to throw the hat, pass the hat around and secure 25,000 rupees at that time, which was a very large sum of money. And with that seed money, he was able to commence the activities of the association. And this uh, oration was in the memory of, his, uh, of Dr. Agrawal's mother. And so, in some ways, you can say that Birabhai uh, Ma is really the mother of surgical gastroenterology in this country. I chose the subject looking back, looking forward, because surgical gastroenterology uh, is in many ways at the crossroads. Winston Churchill said that the long, further back you can look, the further forward you will see, and certainly it's a great idea to look back first and history certainly repeats itself. Spare a thought for someone as brilliant as Shushruta. Uh, and this is the uh, statue of Shushruta in the, in the Patanjali Yogashram in Haridwar. And the reason he looks so pensive and downcast is because he had to do all his surgery, brilliant operations without any anesthesia and only criminals and people of ill fame were able to go to him for treatment. He used black ants to use to create anastomosis of the bowel for per and close perforations. Perhaps the first 
uh, example of absorbable sutures in the intestine. And he also, most importantly, like Andre Vesalius, uh, uh, highlighted the importance of cadaveric dissection as a means of understanding the human body. Fast forward to the recent era, and there were many surgeons in India who epitomized abdominal surgery in the 1930s, 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s in conditions of extreme stress and not great support from ancillary specialities, imaging, and so on. And many of them and, uh, are well known to all of us. The first surgical gastroenterology departments commenced in Trivandrum in Kerala and in Chennai uh, in the 1970s and was soon followed by similar departments in Delhi and Lucknow. But the first MCH course in surgical gastroenterology uh, commenced at the Madras Medical College in the year 1984. Again, to be followed by several others around the country, but still not too many centers offer this course in, in India. I, I was a resident in the, in the PGI in Chandigarh in the, in the early 1980s, and I, I was rotating in general surgery. Um, we, I had, uh, I, I don't know if the, if the hack if the cackling laugh was uh, an indicator that we must draw this uh, to a speedy close. If it repeats itself, we shall. Uh, at the PGI, <coughs> we had a full meal, and I, I apologize for provoking you with this picture of the Onam Sadhya, uh, a very rich meal uh, of hernias, perianal surgery, abdominal surgery of all manners of description, HPB, colorectal, endocrine, adrenalectomies, uh, vascular surgeries, including peripheral vascular disease and aortic aneurysms, aortodeoneal fistulae. So we really saw the gamut of surgery. And we didn't know what existed. We didn't know that it was necessary to focus on an area in order to actually understand disease better and to produce better outcomes. I applied for MCH in 1985, I never gave myself a chance because it was obviously the first, but there was an examination and you know how uh, Providence acts and before long, in 1987, I had an MCH in gastroenterology under my belt. What appeared to be that the MCH course woke up to the need for formal specialization in, in one sphere of surgery. Also made us aware of the complex processes that existed in treatment of GI disease, not just shoot from the hip, not just uh, approach disease with a John Wayne kind of culture, but to delve deep and try to understand. And I must say that this has remained 25 years later an emancipating and fulfilling voyage However, immediately problems surfaced. A very parochial, and I uh, must apologize for that term, a medical society, which seemed unwilling to accept surgical gastroenterology, especially a young maverick, and a lack of concept of a group practice of professionals working together, sharing skills, and providing high quality medical care. And certainly a lack of perception of a partnership with a medical gastroenterologist, all of which conspired to see that you had to move not just from Chandigarh to Chennai, but westwards to a very small village in, in Kerala, uh, which is almost impossible to find on a map unless you sort of zoomed in, uh, a population of 14,300. Uh, most notably, a Wednesday cattle market, which was the real uh, sinosure for the entire neighborhood, for all the nearby towns. An automated bacon processing plant of the meat products of India and nearby Adyar, eight kilometers away. And of course, this little hospital, 150 beds, which had arguably the most outstanding instruments that I've ever used. Great nursing care, uh, spotlessly maintained intensive care unit and operating rooms where there was just the opportunity to work, opportunity to operate, opportunity to achieve close post-operative care 
for a surgeon who lived on campus and who, was, who spent three minutes walking from home to his hospital and into the intensive care if required. Huge periods of inactivity when there were few patients, followed by bursts of chaotic intensity where there were so many patients that you had, didn't have the time to deal with them. The opportunity for long walks in the beautiful countryside and we had, and Philip Thomas and I had actually charted the neighboring countryside with the short, the medium and the intermediate and the long walks and you could get a different terrain each time. And of course watching my own young family grow. The next few years saw tremendous changes in surgical gastroenterology at large and also personally. Surgical gastroenterology grew at fairly uh, astronomical pace. Uh, clearly the specialist emerged who would deal with complex problems. Ability stricture was no longer handled by the so-called generalist. A uh, general surgeon dealt, still dealt with common garden gastrointestinal disease, but this was no, by, by no means uniform. And with the growing popularity and efficiency of healthcare delivered by the surgical gastroenterologist, even common garden problems began to be targeted or began to become the lot of the specialist. So he'd still, he, already, he still got to do the simple open cholecystectomy. Uh, personally, professional personal skills improved. We could, uh, one was able to do one's first liver resection, clad skin resection, pancreatic resection. Uh, somewhere along the line became aware that we needed to document data and the first databases were painfully executed on 120 page uh, exercise books. Quick realization of the inadequacies of our, the care that we gave our patients and the need to travel, to l observe, to learn from others. Some of the reasons for the early development in hindsight were the recognition that a medical surgical partnership which gradually expanded to incorporate other ancillary specialties like pathology, radiology, intensive care and onward is really crucial to providing quality medical care in whatever sphere you may choose. Uh, and documentation and academics and, and uh, reflection is the key to professional growth. The opportunities to, to do research and many of them are serendipitous one actually doesn't go after these things. Sometimes it just happens. Uh, I, I can never forget the, the major breakthrough of hepatitis B with, in, in the Kashmir Valley when so many pregnant women, the epidemic broke and, and simply by taking samples and examining them, uh, we knew more about hepatitis B in one uh, epidemic. Uh, the, the opportunity was not squandered. And the, the point is really that even when opportunity knocks, a man still has to get up off his seat and open the door. Uh, sometimes we fail to do so. As far as chronic pancreatitis was concerned, we realized as we moved from one un unit to another, the importance of follow-up, the importance of recording data, and the importance of documenting failures. Also, the most poignant thing that if I explained what I knew to someone else, I gain the most in the process and when I give a lecture I seem to learn the most rather than the audience and this Latin proverb is very true. When I traveled in South Africa I noticed on the box of uh, the small lunch box that was provided uh, on the flight between Cape Town and Johannesburg uh, this little sign and I didn't know what it meant I asked the it's in Afrikaans but the even the flight attendant did not tell me so I had to go to the Google translate and look at it what it said was to travel is to see and I, I cannot tell you how and I, especially my younger colleagues how illuminating it is for me to visit another center and even watch the most simple operations or the simple treatment processes being carried out in that center which sometimes are so different and so diverse and which open one's own eyes in terms of how one could be treating these patients better. Around the same time as when I graduated as a MCH uh, qualified uh, specialist. Uh, the Indian Association of Surgical Gastroenterology was formed. We had to sign a piece of paper in 1987 which Professor Aranya passed around and we didn't know why we signed it but we just signed it. And we knew that next year we, we had a section in the Association of Surgeons of India called the IASG and here we are. A quarter of a century has elapsed since then. 
what's happened? Where are we now? Thomas Manson said that if you need to prepare for the future, you have to look at the present carefully and to understand the present. Uh, we recognize that much has changed, but much remains the same. What really remains the same is that surgical gastroenterology, and I'm sure you would agree with me that it still remains one of the most fascinating of surgical disciplines. The mystery of the abdomen, despite all the uh, intrusions that high quality imaging and in laboratory testing has made and clinical acumen has made, continues to attract, haunt, humble, and excite, all at the same time. And the ability for us to identify with a specialty which certainly has made huge strides in the level of healthcare. But many things have changed as well. Emergence of subspecialties. Degrees, the issue of degrees versus experience. The issue of Indian versus foreign training. And all of them have asked or raised the question as to whether really surgical gastroenterology is optimally developed at this time. Or is it really going even in the right direction? Little talk of optimal development. I chose to compose a questionnaire <clears throat> which I sent to four tiers or five tiers of people, right from the pioneers in surgical gastroenterology, and I chose eight or ten of them, uh, senior faculty, and I, I crave your forgiveness for assuming that they are my contemporaries just by sheer age, I perhaps qualify. Middle-level faculty, which are those in, perhaps in their early 40s and who have spent close to 10 years in the, in, in the specialty. Newly qualified and, of course, our residents. And it's very strange that out of the questionnaires I, I, I sent, the pioneers seem to give me a, almost 100% uh, response. Every one of them uh, responded, including uh, Professor Angabashim's uh, response, which was uh, emailed to me by his secretary um, uh, two days after his death. And she called al me also to say that he had left it on his desk, and perhaps this was one of his last professional acts that he did, and that was very touching, uh, to say the least. Uh, as we went down to younger generation, there seemed to be a apparent unwillingness to fill this questionnaire and to send it back. Is this attitudinal change or is it apathy? I'm not too sure. The key questions I asked, and there are a few of them, and I shall take each one of them in turn. I asked people whether is experience in working in a center which is acclaimed for gastroenterology, surgical gastroenterology, the key? Or was the label of an MCH or a DNB the key? Most felt that we needed a degree. Uh, although it has lacunae, a DNB or an MCH was desirable. What about, did they welcome the emergence of subspecialties like MCH, HPB, for instance, which we have already in Delhi? Most said that it was premature, but admitted that it was inevitable and that more and more of these are bound to appear. What about two parallel bodies like the MCI and the, D and the National Board both offering qualifications? I think there was uniformity here, that they decried the presence of two bodies. Uh, about two-thirds felt that the National Board was better equipped for overseeing subspecialization. And about a quarter felt that what we needed was for, for subspecialties like gastroenterology to have a special board which would oversee training. The fourth issue was... Was it not a good idea for someone to work in a department of surgical gastroenterology or its subgroup rather than do a formal course in surgical gastroenterology, three years with attendant high costs, especially with the new prevailing conditions? Uh, the, uh, and a reversion, reversion to student days after doing one residency program and even perhaps working in the surgical community? but agreed that strict criteria was felt that strict criteria was required for training and they felt that without this MCH or DNB it would be impossible to really create criteria which were ironclad. I raised the point that most of India's or many of India's prominent and leading and surgical gastroenterologists do not or have not needed to possess a surgical degree or a diploma. 
true of many IASG members, true of IASG office bearers, true of conference organizers. Whereas if you looked at other special subspecialties like cardiac thoracic surgery or urology or uh, neurosurgery, very quickly, very, very small negligible number is actually uh, present in the society who have, uh, who do not possess that degree. And this was further complicated in my opinion by the fact that many qualified MCH or DNB personnel were not able to reach satisfactory levels of training and they had to go to the seemingly unqualified but expert for actually refining their training, which is really uh, a complete uh, a destruction, it appears, of the system because it means that you qualify and then you don't qualify because you need to then go to someone else to, to acquire the expertise. And that meant that the question they asked is, why was it not a tight specialty unlike cardiac, neuro or, uh, or urology? And why there was no polarization even after 25 years after the speciality really came into being, uh, we, we still have no clarity as to what constitutes surgical gastroenterology. And the general agreement was that uh, most felt that the lack of definition of the boundaries of surgical gastroenterology and the fact that there is overlap of general surgery and finally a lack of uniform cohesion with medical gastroenterology has all contributed to this situation. I provoked the, the response, responders to ask if a five to seven year surgical gastroenterology program starting with MBBS is appropriate. Two years of basic surgical training or three years of basic surgical training, two years of general GI training and two years of specialized training in a field of their choice which may be HPB or it may be colorectal or it may be transplantation, it may be any one of these. Uh, some said yes, but most, some said it was possible, but others felt it was impractical. And this, they quoted the example of the five-year cardiac and the MCH course as suggesting that it simply won't work. There was, in, in, when I asked them for their general opinion, many mentioned that training standards needed to be tightened rather than examination standards or bureaucratic standards certification, credentialing, this scheme seemed to, uh, f the terms seemed to recur in the, in the responses in the, in the anything other, do you want to add anything else uh, category in most of the respondees. And then when I asked what can be done to refine and improve the status of surgical gastroenterology in India, uh, the general opinion was India is a large country, our needs are vast and varied, but no solutions were forthcoming. It is strange that 25 years after the emergence of surgical gastroenterology in this country, surgical gastroenterologists still feel threatened by general surgeons. And the Association of Surgical Gastroenterologists of Kerala was created in 2006. Uh, basically, and, and, and the motto at that time clearly stated was that we want to try and show everyone what was different in surgical gastroenterology. I'm not sure if that objective was ever achieved. The lack of standardization complicated matters further. We had the MCI and the DNB, as I have already stated. The MCI was rather like an impenetrable maze. You, you couldn't even get into it. And the DNB was like a chakra view. You couldn't get out of it because the exit exam was more difficult. Uh, Professor Kaushik and, uh, used to always lament that DNB would never work in India because private sector institutions would not give hands-on training. And, uh, I'm certain he understands that that's not the case. Um, MCH, we, we were led to believe that training and teaching must be the prerogative of public sector, but that's changed dramatically. Uh, MCH is also available in private institutions. Not just that, that it contributes to lack of standardization, but also means variable training costs, and it's eventually further likely to impact on the healthcare. So I ask myself the question, is it because surgical gastroenterology has not risen above the morass that it began, that it has not risen to such specialization, such high quality, it remains a basic discipline, or that is that it is at best a loose division bound by some anatomic and physiologic bonds? Most responses to the questionnaire agreed that that was the case. 
Many of us, many young, young of our younger colleagues, because of these confusions, choose to go abroad and straight away acquire skills in some chosen field. They are unable to stay back in that country because they do not meet the rigorous standards of training of that country. But they return to India. And here we have no credentialing system, so you have a wide variety of variation of expertise, skill sets, and they assimilate into this system, further causing lack of standardization or dilution or whatever you may call it. If you look at the rest of the world, the U USA has no surgical gastroenterology. UK does not call surgical gastroenterology. Europe has surgical gastroenterology, chirurgy, digestive, they call it. But they quickly divide it into four gut, which is the hepatectomist, the pancreatectomist, the esophagic and the stomach, and the hindgut, which is a colorectal surgeon. Uh, is surgical gastroenterology really, gentlemen and ladies, an invalid option? Uh, the, it, is, it is really interesting to note that a month ago, the European Digestive Surgery Meet, which had papers on liver disease, and liver surgery, pancreatic surgery, colorectal surgery, the first prize was on carcinoma stomach. How often does that happen in the Indian Association of Surgical Gastroenterology? And I must, not so much in lighter vein, but in, on a serious note, uh, highlight this sort of staging or classification that Ramesh Ardhanari and I cooked up some years ago on, in one of these fora, fora. That class one to seven in IASG, 1A, those who do living related liver transplantation, 1B, those who did deceased donor liver transplantation, non-transplant hepatobiliary surgery is only class two, Class three is pancreatic surgery, further down. Four gut surgery, sympathies to Chandramon, class four. Colorectal surgery, five. Perianal surgery, six. And if you, are, if you say you have laparoscopic skills, skills then you're seven, uh, even though you may be a very uh, accomplished laparoscopic surgeon. And uh, this is a really poignant statement because one of the biggest problems that we have faced in the Indian Association of Surgical Gastroenterology in a country with no standards in terms of rewards, incentives, or compensation, unlike in the NHS where the colorectal surgeon and the HPB surgeon earn the same amount of money, here there is so much uh, pseudo-glamour, you may call it, you may call it whatever you like, where some components of surgical gastroenterology are seen to be better than others or higher than others completely anonymous, completely incorrect, but nevertheless true. And all of that is put together into professional body and Indian Association of Surgical Gastroenterology is right in the middle of this equation. And so the individual is beset with these complex thoughts. Let's not put our heads under the sand like the ostrich. Let us fast forward to tomorrow and recognize that surgical gastroenterology shall and will be a sort of a lymphatic watershed, which will be subscribed, contributed, intruded, if you like, by various other disciplines like surgical oncology, minimally invasive surgery, robotic surgery, general surgery. And each one of these need to have separate identities because it is necessary for somebody who wants to uh, improve in a certain sphere to focus on that area. And to get like-minded people to sit down and discuss and interact, it may be necessary to have those sub-disciplines. And also recognize that there are already offspring of surgical gastroenterology, HPB, colorectal, transplantation, and to realize that this has to work. This has to be a system that works. So we need to reflect, regroup, and reorganize ourselves. And also understand, as was mentioned in the questionnaire, that India does need general surgeons, India needs a general surgical gastroenterologist, and India does need a specialist HPB, colorectal, or transplant surgeon. How can we achieve it? When Hong Kong was given back to China, there was this one country, two systems uh, uh, idea of the Chinese. And I, I present a unifying concept of general surgery and surgical gastroenterology. Let's face the facts. It's naive and unrealistic to expect laparoscopic appendicectomy to be performed by a surgical gastroenterologist, or indeed a low anal fistula by a colorectal surgeon. 
But a Crohn's disease with perianal suppuration and complex fistula is a different ball game. The big deal is how to tell one from the other, the simple one from the complicated one. Surgical gastroenterology boards must be present, which must define curricula. A basic MS general surgery is a must. And that must be the bedrock on which one may choose to become a generalist surgical gastroenterologist or a specialist HPB, colorectal, or transplant, or whatever you like. You have to provide options for each. You have to provide certification for the generalist and the specialist. Credentialing, recredentialing, assessment of centers and reassessment of centers is absolutely imperative if one has to have standardization. We need a uniform board and a single one, which has to merge with which is a matter of political uh, decision making. And national standard is desirable because we need to be able to globalize at least within our country rather than to have one center of excellence and several which are mediocre. And specialist training must involve working to train, not pay a fee for training. This is not a three-day course for which you pay a certain number of dollars, pounds, or rupees, but a lifetime investment and must be paid for in sweat and blood and tears rather than currency. My young colleagues face many special questions. What section of surgical gastroenterology do I embrace? How do I come to terms with the high cost of postgraduate education? Is, why doesn't somebody certify me after two years or one year of uh, training? How does one come to terms with peer pressure, spousal pressure? And I can tell you, I understand from my colleagues that that's a huge problem nowadays. And the new generation culture of planning one's life so precisely. And I just want to make three recommendations. This is not for our senior people, it's just for the youngsters. And for those who know all about it, you can just go back, to go to sleep. Um, David, Dwight Eisenhower, who was the general commander, supreme commander of the armed forces uh, at the end of World War II, and who went on to be president of the United States, talked about prioritizing and the wisdom of taking first things first. Um, do remember, and I'm sure many of you know this story, but remember the, when, when you are hard pressed, 24 hours a day are not enough, remember the mayonnaise jar and the two pints of beer. The professor who walked into the first day of term wordlessly placed a jar, mayonnaise jar on the table, brought out three bags, the first which contained golf balls, which we placed in the uh, bottle. The bottle became full. He asked the audience, was the bottle full? And they said, yes. And then he opened the second bag, which contained pebbles. And he proceeded to layer the pebbles, which found its way between the golf balls. And then the, again, the audience said the bottle was full. And then he opened the third bag, which contained sand, finely powdered sand. And when he poured a hell of a lot of sand, also entered the bottle. And again, the bottle was full. And then he opened two cans of beer and poured the beer. And, and he tried, then he proceeded to do the same in the reverse order. Once he put the sand in, there was no room for the pebbles or for the golf balls. And then he said the golf balls were, was the most important priority, one's family, one's health. The pebbles were the values that you uh, considered in your life, your profession, and the sand, the material uh, possessions. And he said it's important to prioritize and put the golf balls first. Of course, there was a hand at the back, back of the audience which said, what about the beers? And he said that in the jar of life, there's always room for a couple of beers afterwards. And in fact, you must use uh, forums like these to renew old friendships, to create new friendships and build bonds, because that's what's going to last you at the end of the day. The second is that we all run on a wheel. And the wheel of life is composed of many spokes. And the sp each of the spokes is designed by what the number of roles you play in your life. And if you score in your self-assessment scoring a 10 out of 10, you can give yourself a 10 in, in that particular category. But if you have a lopsided development of your personality, and remember surgeons are people who have to face more stress than most other individuals. You need a system in your body which can take care of and de-stress. 
you need a uniform development of personality. You need to understand that a wheel like this cannot run. And so the spokes have to be evenly developed. So if you have ten uh, uh, spheres that you consider important, but you are very conservative and you score only two in each one of them, you will have a very small wheel which will go very slowly and never get you anywhere. You need obviously a bigger wheel. You need to be able to diversify your thought process, not be a one-track, one-trick pony, not be a surgeon from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m., but to think, to think beyond surgery. Uh, and then you have a large wheel which may run better and not in a wobbly way like this one. And it must be evenly developed if you have to de-stress yourself. So let our wheel of life have enough spokes, first of all, to give it strength. If you have one spoke only, it's going to break. It must have long spokes to allow it to run fast and have uniform length of spokes to allow it to, be ru to run through. <coughs> and my last statement seems controversial, but Winston Churchill said, you have enemies. Good. That means you have stood for something in something, uh, sometime in your life. I don't suggest for a moment that you create enemies. But if you were to walk by the street and you notice that several people are, have accosted a young woman, do you have the courage to walk away? Will you be, ever be able to face your image in the mirror for the rest of your life? Is it not better to face up that situation, to speak what you have to do, even at the risk of receiving a knife in your side? It is more a question of where the courage lies, the courage to live thereafter, or the courage to face the situation. And it's probably better, whether it's an academic forum, or an ethical forum, or in, in a personal forum, to speak and be damned, rather than not, not at all. And in that sense, what better way in the city of joy than to quote these immortal phrases from Gitanjali and Rabindranath Tagore, where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out from the depths of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by thee into ever-widening thought and action, into that heaven of freedom. We need to awake, not just in life, but in surgical gastroenterology. I thank the Indian Association of Surgical Gastroenterology for the great time that I have received personally in my professional and personal career and all the friends uh, I have achieved over the years and the audience for their attention. Thank you very much.